When you start getting into native plants, as one kind of peeks through the archway into that area, a common question that might be embarrassingly whispered is, so what is the difference exactly between a native plant and a non-native plant? And then what about naturalized plants, invasive plants? It's actually kind of a good question. So step through that archway, sit down on that log right over there, and imagine an orchestra. I'm going to use an orchestra analogy. So the quote on the screen right now is a helpful one to kind of set as a base in your mind. It will help us understand kind of the time scale of things that we're going to be talking about. Okay, so let's start with a native plant. A native plant is a plant that originates in a particular place and is part of the balance of nature in that place that has developed, adapted, and evolved there for over hundreds of thousands of years. Plants that are here in the United States and North America that have been here since before European settlement are generally considered native. Now, whether you consider this European settlement to have started around 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue or earlier, maybe some history nitpicky people will say it's around the 900s actually, that detail doesn't actually matter. We're talking about plants that have been here in North America for hundreds of thousands of years. That's a native plant. Okay, so if you totally get that and you're like, yeah, thumbs up, girl, got it, native plant, hundreds of thousands of years, you can go to chapter two about non-native plants. Um, But if you want to dig a little deeper with me into a native plant, here we go. So when we say that a plant is part of the balance of nature and that it has developed, adapted, and evolved in a certain place, this is actually a really, really complex thing indeed. So goldenrod, for example, there are hundreds of insects that we know about, and there's probably a ton we don't know about, that rely on goldenrod. Goldenrod is a really important native plant. And these insects rely on it for nectar and pollen. They might rely on it for their caterpillar babies to eat the leaves, and some adult insects themselves just eat the leaves. They rely on it for its cover and protection. They rely on it for nesting and for laying eggs. And all of these reliances, they depend on this relationship. Some insects have adapted to look like parts of the goldenrod flowers or parts of the goldenrod leaves or stems so that they can blend in and get good protection and cover. It takes hundreds of thousands of years to develop that kind of close relationship. There's lots of caterpillars, which are moth and butterfly babies, don't forget. Um, These caterpillars that look like the plants that they rely on for food and protection when they're in that vulnerable caterpillar phase. In the nectar and pollen of these native plants, there's a ratio in there of carbohydrates to fats to proteins that insects and plants have optimized together over these hundreds of thousands of years. So, right, humans aren't the only things that uh, need to be concerned with with carbs and fat and protein. (laughs) It's important for all the organisms out there. And plants and insects and birds, they've all uh, developed this close relationship and the ratio of those nutrients in these plants and in the nectar and in the pollen is pretty precise for a lot of organisms. Different birds look to the seeds of particular plants to help get them through winter time and those seeds have certain amounts of fats and nutrients that are right for those birds and right for the plant and the seed itself right and birds feed their baby birds mostly with caterpillars so caterpillars are these fat juicy tender morsels Mm, caterpillars And a baby bird needs roughly a couple hundred caterpillars a day to make it to that fledgling sort of teenager status. And so, well, that number of 
caterpillars depends on the bird species of course but then anyways there's bigger animals the deer that eat certain leaves the groundhogs the bunny rabbits they all have nutritional requirements that have been evolved and adapted over time and are met by certain tasty plants and on and on and on And so all of this is to say that this relationship between a native plant and a native insect, a native bird, a native animal, and native plants with each other is this deep, deep relationship. And it's based on look, on smell, on exact nutrients, on nutrient ratios, on sound. It's like this deep relationship that's highly complex, not chaotic just very complex. And so with a native plant, there's this long, deep relationship um, as the plant and all the other players in a place grow and change together over these hundreds of thousands of years. And sometimes those changes are harmonious and beautiful. Sometimes they're like antagonistic and really ugly, (laughs) but they are changing together in response to each other in this complex orchestral entanglement. I say entanglement, but again, not chaotic, complex. A complex orchestra. So, let's get to that orchestra analogy. You might think of an orchestra, like a symphonic orchestra, as your native plant community here in North America. That's the orchestra. And a native plant, you might imagine, is like a cello in the orchestra, a cello. And that cello has the sheet music. It's been practicing with the group for a long time. It just fits right in. So, all right, we got what a native plant is. Check, that makes sense. So non-native plants. So non-native plants is a plant that has been brought to a new place, either on purpose or by accident, We have examples of both, (laughs) and these plants have not evolved in that location for hundreds of thousands of years. So plants that are here in the United States and in North America that came here after European settlement are generally considered non-native plants. I will give you a link in the description uh, for this video to a couple videos I have on tulips and on daffodils. Those are non-native plants and you can learn about how they got here to North America to help sort of fill out the picture of how some of these native plants got here to begin with, right? So if you totally got it, thumbs up. I know what a non-native is. You can move on to the next chapter about naturalized plants. Uh, But let's For everyone staying, let's dig a little deeper here into non-native. And so from what I said about native plants, it helps to imagine that complex symphony of interactions that has developed and waxed and waned in elegance and beauty and in roughness and ugliness for hundreds of thousands of years and then beep boop, a plant from another continent is brought over. That's a non-native plant. It's part of its own complex orchestra of interactions for hundreds of thousands of years, but on another continent with its own orchestral partners. The orchestra playing here in North America is a different group than the orchestra playing in Europe, which is a different group than the orchestra playing in Australia, which is a different group than the orchestra playing in Kamchatka. Does that make sense? And so a non-native plant here in North America probably won't have been here for more than a couple hundred years. And I know for us humans, a couple hundred years seems like a very long time, (laughs) because it is. But um, we often think, oh, that's enough time for a non-native plant to evolve and be involved in this complex interactions in this new location. But in truth, These interactions and changes that happen between all of these species in this area takes thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years. Okay, so all the other community members in a location, let's say here in North America, in the face of a new non-native plant, beep boop, that just got brought in, will be so unfamiliar with the new plant that many insects and pollinators 
don't even recognize the plant at all. Like they don't even recognize it as a plant and or they don't even recognize it as a plant that could be useful. This is often because a new plant has a color they don't recognize, a smell they don't recognize, ultraviolet light patterns on the petals or leaves that they don't recognize. And I mean, there's electrostatic charges (laughs) to a plant that we don't notice, right? (laughs) But insects and pollinators do. And those electrostatic charges could even be unfamiliar. And so if those insects and pollinators, let's say they do recognize a plant. Let's say they're like, hey, that's a plant. They often don't know how to use it. They don't know where to land on it, how to get into the flower. They don't know how to eat from it. And then let's even say that they can get pollen and nectar from it. Or maybe they can chomp on the leaves or something. So right now I'm imagining uh, lavender. So lavender is a non-native plant. But um, if you've ever seen lavender in bloom, you'll notice that there are a lot of bees uh, and insects around it. And so a lot of people will go, well, it's a non-native plant, but it's sure, you know, it's obviously okay for all of our pollinators. Well, here we come back to that ratio problem again of carbohydrate to fat to protein in the parts of the flower and the leaves. And those will be different than what the insect needs. The insects, though, that are able to use a non-native plant, they don't know that, though. They don't know that the carbohydrates and fats and proteins are all off. And so the wrong nutrient ratio in these non-native pollens and nectars and leaves can end up in the early death of an insect. And I don't mean that in some, well, hypothetically, I mean that in actuality. We have evidence of that, right? This wrong ratio can kill these insects, uh, and it doesn't take very long even, because they're relying on that energy and they need it quick and fast to get through each and every day. And if it's not right, they can tank pretty fast, which is actually kind of sad. <laughs> um, But maybe they don't die. Sometimes it just creates infertility in them. And again, they don't know that that's happened, uh, but they are suddenly infertile. Or sometimes the insect itself is fine, but its offspring, its little insect babies, themselves are infertile or messed up in some other way. And so now non-native plants, if insects can even recognize them, they're leading to future generations of insects, bees and butterflies and moths and everything that are messed up in their own way. And so now you can kind of understand how we've ended up in this insect apocalypse, right? Well, there's lots of reasons for it, but this is an additional reason, right? Is that sometimes these generations of insects are in trouble because these ratios of nutrients aren't right in these non-native plants. It's wild, isn't it? And now this isn't always true. There's always exceptions. But this happens more commonly than you'd think. So a native plant might be like a cello in an orchestra. And the orchestra itself is like uh, the native plant community here in North America. And that native plant that's like the cello has the right sheet music, it belongs there, it's all interacting, and it's all good. A non-native plant might be something like an electric guitar. An electric guitar that sits down to play in this orchestra. It doesn't have any sheet music, it doesn't even have a proper place to sit or be, but there it is, busting on in, playing something. And it's totally messing up the orchestral arrangement. Okay, so we've got the native and the non-native plant differentiation figured out. Okay, and so for North America, we really are somewhat lucky here that we have the happy and simple delineation for our little brains (laughs) that a plant that has been here since before European settlement, it's almost always going to be native. And a plant that came here after European settlement, it's almost always non-native. Awesome. Easy. Okay. I love easy. So let's move on to the more controversial and dicey naturalized plants and invasive plants. I say controversial and dicey because there's some nuances here that us plant people will disagree upon. That'll be fine. Okay. So naturalized plants, you will notice here that I have sort of put them underneath the non-native plants. 
that's because naturalized plants are non-native. So a naturalized plant is a non-native plant that can spread. It can reproduce and establish a population without the help of people. Many non-native plants can't do bupkis on their own. So I'm thinking about like tulips, for example. That's non-native. And what do we have to do every year or two with tulips? You have to keep planting more bulbs. They just don't reproduce and create populations on their own, right? They need our help. So that's just a plain old non-native. Naturalized is a plant that doesn't need our help. It can reproduce and make its own population and kind of keep going all on its own now. Um, they can make seeds, they can disperse those seeds, they can spread in an area. Now it's not out of control spreading, it's just regular-like spreading. And so, and this is where we get a little controversial, some people will sometimes consider a naturalized plant to now be part of a local community, a local plant, well, actually a whole local ecosystem community. (laughs) Some people will even say that it's like a healthy part of a local plant community. And again, it can be divisive and plant people will argue. These are the plant people arguments at Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, but they actually are not native plants. They're not a good part of a native plant community and they don't become native. There is no naturalized plants become native plants. That doesn't happen in our lifespan. That can take, again, hundreds of thousands of years, right? Um, And the best example I have of a naturalized plant right off the top of my head is ox eye daisy. So this is a plant that is often part of native plant seed mixes, right? But it's not. It's a non-native plant. It's just that it's naturalized. So, and it, it gets visited by pollinators. It makes seeds and it spreads. And so to our human eyes, it kind of looks a little bit like a regular part of a native plant community. But we can't forget again that pollen, the nectar, the leaves, the seeds, uh, the way things look and smell, the ratio in those things of carbohydrate to fat to protein. I know you're going to keep hearing this. You're going to be like, yeah, I get it. The carbs, the fats, I know. But it's so important. Um, Those ratios are unlikely to be well in sync with what native insects, pollinators, birds, and animals are needing. Um, Another example is... Uh, winter aconite. So I have a video on winter aconite too. I'll give you a link in the video description on that. That's another non-native plant uh, that actually walks the line between non-native, naturalized, and invasive. It kind of depends who you ask, but I talk about that in that video. I'll give you a link just if you want to dig a little more into this naturalized plant idea, right? And so if we think of this complex orchestra analogy, our North American plants are this orchestra, and our native plant is like a cello, and a simply non-native plant is like an electric guitar. And so then a naturalized plant might be like an electric guitar, which is non-native, but then that electric guitar has put a cover over the instrument to look like a cello or something. And they're using the cello sheet music even, right? And they're playing that cello sheet music on their covered up electric guitar. And so at a quick glance, they kind of fit in, you know? Sometimes when they're playing, maybe it even sounds good or okay. But at closer inspection, you begin to see, now, wait a minute, you're not from around here, are you? (laughs) So uh, we've got native plants non-native plants, and then a type of non-native plant, which is a naturalized plant. Um, And then that just leaves invasive plants. And again, there's a little division here and there in the plant community regarding some of the details on invasive plants. Okay, so an invasive plant, you can see I've got that definition also underneath the non-native plant umbrella. So an invasive plant is a non-native plant that grows out of control in an area, on a whole continent. Um, And it's so out of control in a new area that it can take over and end up ruining the location that it has been brought to. And so um, sometimes a native plant 
can be considered invasive in some areas and under some conditions, but, and this is where we get nuanced and people argue, but for us, let's stick to a more common definition and not get too messy today. Um, An invasive plant is non-native, brought to a new place, takes over entirely, grows out of control, drowns out the local and native plants, often entirely drowns out the local and native plants. So that naturalized plant won't like kill everything in its path or completely take over and make our native plants rare or endangered. Um, But an invasive plant will. An invasive plant can take over so, 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 so well because for a couple reasons. One, like most non-native plants, it doesn't really have any animals that likes to eat its flowers or its leaves or anything. No natural predators. It doesn't have any caterpillars that like eating its leaves. It doesn't really have a lot of diseases going around over here that will affect it, like bacterial diseases, fungal diseases, viral diseases uh, that can like kill or hinder it. Um, And now there's nuance here. Always know that there's nuance and exceptions, but generally speaking, Um, And unlike a regular non-native plant, an invasive plant also has like a life plan (laughs) that includes spreading quickly. So this might be like rhizomes that are the fast growing kind of rhizomes. I have a video on rhizomes. I'll put a link for you on that one in the video description too. Um, So an an invasive plant can have rhizomes that are the fast-growing kind. Or it has a way to disperse seeds that is highly efficient. So like little tiny seeds that just blow away on the wind, thousands of them. Oh yeah, invasive plants will do that. Or some of them have those seeds with the little um, seed pods that when you touch them, they go boop and they pop all over the place. (laughs) Invasive plants can uh, often will do that, right? And sometimes it's just seeds that might germinate really quickly or easily. So when you get into native plants, there's some things you might try to grow from seed that are particularly difficult. (laughs) An invasive non-native plant uh, will have seeds that usually germinate rather efficiently. And so with invasive plants, I can think of two great examples right off the top of my head. So easy. Bush honeysuckle is invasive. And so is garlic mustard. Both of these plants are non-native. They spread quickly. Uh, They take over an area. Um, They drown out the native plants there. North America is not where they're from. Um, The native insects and animals can get into trouble when they use these plants. Um, That winter aconite plant that I mentioned, and I'm I've already got a link down there waiting for you uh, for a video on that. Uh, Some people will say that that's actually uh, not a naturalized plant. It's an invasive plant. So again, you can watch that video and tiptoe around in the weeds on that one. And so in our orchestra analogy, a symphony orchestra, as you imagine it, that's your native plant community here in North America. The cello is a native plant. Hello, cello. The non-native plant would be like an electric guitar coming in and sitting down and playing whatever he wants. That's your non-native plant. Your naturalized plant is that electric guitar coming in, putting on a cello costume, and semi-successfully playing cello music in which it takes a little closer inspection to go, wait a minute, this isn't where you came from. That's your naturalized plant. And then for your invasive plants, That's that electric guitar coming in and sitting down and then making a hundred new electric guitars and all of them are playing all at once, whatever they want, just like an invasive plant. I'm imagining the flutes, the bassoon, the violas, and the cellos, they're all drowned out. Maybe they're getting like elbows and (laughs) kicks to the shins and maybe a bunch of them just walk off stage and leave because it's all electric guitar now. That's an invasive plant. All right, so that's it. That's your what a native plant is and a non-native plant. And then as a under the non-native umbrella is where our naturalized or invasive plants go. And if you dig more into the community, you will quickly see that there is some division um, in whether a naturalized plant is something that you want or don't want. 
uh, you may have picked up that my viewpoint is one of, hey, just stick to native plants. We got enough of them. They're amazing. You don't need naturalized. But that's totally just my opinion. Um, And on screen now, you can see our orchestra analogy, uh, if that is helpful to you, uh, between the native and non-native plants and naturalized and invasive. You've got it down now, so get out there and, you know, plant native.